I'm Tracy Kinsella, Executive Director with the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame. We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is located on the meeting place of Treaty 7 and Treaty 6 regions. This area is the traditional territory of the Blackfoot, including the Siksika, the Pekani, and the Kainai peoples, the Sutina, Stony Nakoda, Cree, Soltu, and Métis peoples. We are delighted to welcome you to celebrate the extraordinary contributors to sport in Alberta. Since 1957, the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame has existed to honour, preserve and celebrate Alberta sport achievement through our annual induction of athletes, builders, media personnel, teams and pioneers. With the inclusion of the 2020 induction class, we will have inducted over 1,600 sport heroes and they will have joined the distinct group that is the honoured members of the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame. I want to take a moment to recognize the unprecedented times that we find ourselves in. The induction of this class was to be held in May 2020 and has subsequently been postponed numerous times. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Albertans have been adapting to one change after another. The cancellation of sports from the minor leagues that our children competed in to the professional leagues we missed watching. In sport, we are resilient and this class is a classic example of what it takes to become an honoured member. Even though we are not physically together this evening, by celebrating the induction of our newest honoured members, we will ensure the impact of these stories and the influence these individuals have made to sport is not lost. Good evening, everyone. I'm Quinn Phillips, your MC for the evening, a longtime sports broadcaster, very excited to join you. Welcome to our honored members, friends and family joining us for this live virtual induction ceremony for the class of 2020 to the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. It is a pleasure to welcome you here virtually. Even though we are not together in person, the accomplishments and legacy of these 13 athletes, builders and award recipients are worthy of recognition. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have all been waiting for, the 2020 Alberta Sports Hall of Fame inductees. Deidre Dion, Freestyle Skiing Athlete Award. Jan Allmark, Figure Skater Building Award. Ken Babby, Hockey Builder Award. Kelly Sutherland, Chuck Wagon Athlete Award. Terry Morris, Curling Builder Award. Chris Phillips, Hockey Athlete. Mike Robertson, Snowboard Cross Athlete. Derek Douglas, Soccer Builder. John Curry, Multi-Sport Builder. Stan Wakelin, Pioneer Builder Award. Nancy Southern and Ian Allison, the Bell Media Award. Dennis Kadat's Legacy Award. Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations to your 2020 Alberta Sports Hall of Fame inductees. Before we get the night really rolling, we take you to Brent LaBross for the singing of our national anthem. Oh, Canada, our home and native land. True patriot love in all of us command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true nor strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land, Gloria 
us and free. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Wow, what a powerful rendition of O Canada. Hi, I'm Ron Sauve, Regional Vice President, RBC Royal Bank for Central Alberta. Since 2012, we have proudly partnered with the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame on their Beyond the Classroom educational program. The Alberta Sports Hall of Fame and Museum provides a unique opportunity to inspire learning beyond the classroom and for students of all ages to experience and explore some of Alberta's incredible sport history and heroes. It helps children see the world differently. Students have the opportunity to experience and learn how sports, athletes, training, and equipment has evolved throughout the years. Students use the museum as a classroom through learner-led tours, inquiry-based learning, and hands-on activities. Education programs are designed to meet a large range of learning outcomes for different grades and will help encourage critical thinking and open doors in achieving dreams and goals. With curriculum-based focus programs such as Lasting Traditions, students will explore and learn about Aboriginal traditional games such as lacrosse, snowshoeing, and snow snake. Classrooms will experience and appreciate the diversity of Canada's heritage, and it is supported with pictures, archives, and stories highlighting inducted Indigenous individuals such as Dr. Willie Littlechild, Alex Dakota, Charlie Swallface, Jim Gladstone Jr., and Deerfoot. All students that visit and interact in the museum will experience and learn to appreciate the health benefits of living an active way of life. Learn how leadership, teamwork, goal setting, and personal challenge can lead to successful accomplishments and honor. RBC appreciates our partnership with the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame and Museum. We value their interactive, hands-on approach to celebrate sports history in Alberta. Deidre Dion was a trailblazer for Canadian athletes competing in the sport of freestyle skiing today. She started skiing at the age of three, but did not join the Red Deer Freestyle Club, located at Canyon Ski Resort, until almost a decade later. Under the mentorship of Murray Clough, it wasn't long before Deidre began excelling on a provincial, national, and eventually international stage. Her accomplishments are exceptional. Silver at the 2008 Canadian Freestyle Championships, 2000 World Cup Freestyle Rookie of the Year, bronze medals at both the 2001 and 2003 World Championships, and a bronze medal in women's aerials at the 2002 Salt Lake City Winter Olympics. And despite breaking her neck in a training accident in September 2005, Deidre battled back to compete at one last Olympic Games in 2006. I grew up watching Jamie Soleil and Jeremy Weatherspoon go to the Olympics and be medal contenders, and that was what I was looking at. Well, in 2002 was my first Olympics, and so it was so special to be in that group, mostly because a lot of the athletes that I looked up to in, in four years previous, um, they were still around. I, was walking into an opening ceremonies alongside people that um, I really had really strived to be my whole life. 2006 Olympics, five months prior to the Olympics, uh, took a fall that instantly knew that that was a different outcome and so uh, broke my neck and, and suddenly those dreams of like Olympic glory, they fade pretty quickly to just like quality of life. Um, I competed and I'm super proud of that now, but in that moment it was devastating to know that sometimes timing just isn't on your side and you're one of the very few people in life that show up and are judged by the world on one second of one day of your piece of work and you're okay living on both the failure and the success side of that is probably one of the bravest things that I've ever done in my life. I had a podium in 2008 post breaking my neck that it had been a long time since I'd been on the podium and it was years of hard work and years of like building a confidence that used to just be innate. 
to be able to just have that week where everything just felt like it did when I was 19. Um, but knowing that that journey had been like 10 years in the making and it was right on the tail end of my career. So that silver medal probably sticks out as one of the most hard fought medals and, and moments that I worked for in my career. I just think, first of all, a massive thank you to my family, but even more so to my sport and to my coaches who looked at sport through the lens of both men and women and girls and boys and made sure that the sport had a gender lens and was both fun and um, built for success. Um, and I hope it's something that other sports can look at and say, how do we apply a gender lens so we don't lose female participation at the rates that we do and that girls stick around in sport just as long as men do. Since arriving in Alberta in 1973, Jan Allmark and his elite coaching skills have made an indelible mark on the sport of figure skating in Canada. As the director of skating at Edmonton's Royal Glenora Club, Jan elevated the club to prominence as one of the country's top training centers. Under his tutelage, the club began to consistently produce national and international competitors. Among the athletes who benefited from his guidance were Michael Slipchuk, who won the 1992 Canadian Championship, Canmore's Jane Gray, who competes on the national stage, former national skater Robin Forsyth, three-time Canadian national medalist Ben Ferreira, as well as the team of Jamie Soleil and David Peltier, who went on to win gold in pairs figure skating at the 2002 Salt Lake City Winter Games. With his induction into the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame, Jan joins former protégés Slipchuk, Saleh and Peltier as an honoured member. I was 13 when I started figure skating, which is old. Competed in the European Championship and international events. I was uh, at university, I was uh, taking business, and I was approached by some people to teach their children. I realized I was quite good at it. Then I took some physiology and biomechanics and some anatomy classes because I said, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do it right. I coached a little bit in Sweden for one year and then came to Lethbridge and I've been in Canada ever since. One thing that I think is missing in the whole Canadian sport, there's no uh, emphasis on pedagogics, which is something we learned in, in my country. It's the science of teaching. Teaching of teaching. Yeah, because I think that you can learn from each other. And we don't, we don't have enough discussions about the finesse. It's a very technical sport. You never know anything in this sport. And I've taught Jamie since he was young, off and on. And uh, I only taught David that, that year before Olympic together as a pair. And I said to them, I said, you know, we have to do more training. You are world champions, but you have to do, has to step it up. And they worked, they agreed and they worked for us. They're all different. You can't you can't teach everybody the same way. Some people have to be, you can be quiet, some of them you have to talk a little more to it. You, you know, you have to learn how to, you're gonna fit in with them at that time. But I feel like knowing that people think I contributed to the skating in this country, and also that I always felt that I was fair and square with my students. You know, you're very honored. <laughs> you're very honored and, and uh, uh, at times I don't think, I don't deserve to be on the wall with them because I was just the coach. During Ken Babby's 27 seasons at the helm, the Canadian Colleges Athletic Association National Hockey Championships were held 10 times. Sate came home with silver twice and gold once. The seven-time ACAC Coach of the Year set conference coaching records with 23 playoff berths, 10 first-place finishes, and nine championships. The 2000 CCAA Coaching Award of Excellence recipient stepped down in 2014 with the Canadian post-secondary record 
534 regular season and postseason wins and a winning percentage of 661. The Alberta Hockey Hall of Fame member was also athletic director at SAIT for 17 years. Met a gentleman by the name of Tom Malloy who was uh, coaching the SAIT Trojans men's hockey team and was looking for an assistant coach and I thought well, I might as well try it. Threw my name into that and uh, got my first taste at coaching college hockey in Alberta. It was a great opportunity for me to do what uh, I really wanted to do and that was coach, coach hockey and teach at the same time. Did all my coaching certifications up to the highest ones that you can do at Hawk Canada. As you go up, it gets harder. When I was going through the coaching certification programs, they were tough, man. We were two, three o'clock in the morning, not drinking beer at night. We were figuring out drills, fighting, arguing with each other. I was going through Mike Babcock, uh, Perry Pern, all those guys were in the program together and we're all were vying for rising up the ranks, right? So, and then I started working towards uh, the national coaching certification. I and mean, the committee uh, offered me the under 18 national team uh, one summer and I coached that team. We won a gold medal in uh, Kesemarug, Slovakia. And then from that, I've got a couple opportunities working with the national senior team, um, being an assistant coach there. I got opportunities to work with Denmark. As I was still working at SAIT coaching full time and all this, I just worked it in, took holidays, and I did three years with the national junior team there. Now I'm back with Hockey Canada again. It's just been a great opportunity. I really fell in love with, it, with this sport. I thought it was so amazing what these guys were doing in sleds and at such a high pace and high skill level it just kind of blew me away and I thought you know what I think I can help this this program because they don't have an identity and they need to have an identity and create a culture of being full-time athletes and uh, we were scratching every day to uh, to get ourselves to a gold medal. I went to so many coaching conferences I still attend them I think coaching for me is, is like teaching, right? So as competitive as I am, I always uh, had to catch myself and say, okay, you gotta step back and teach this first before you can get the product that you want at the end, right? So it's about building the process towards the product. Every game matters, every drill matters, you know, and uh, we all have off days for sure, but uh, you can't have too many in a row. And I think that's the life story, is in life, you gotta get up and go to work every day. I gotta get up and go to work to every day. You can have an off day, but you can't have too many in a row. I'm very humbled and honored to be uh, inducted into 2020 class in the Alberta Sport Hall of Fame and um, just very, uh, very, very pleased of the recognition. I'd like to congratulate uh, the 2020 class. Uh, what a great group of athletes and leaders. Um, your achievements are amazing and you've made uh, Alberta, Alberta sport and Canada and the world in general a better place by doing everything you've done. Um, my, my career started in minor hockey. Um, that's where I found a passion for coaching and it allowed me to uh, work towards uh, becoming a coach. And I first co started coaching minor hockey teams and I really was fueled by the desire to become a college, college coach and, and teacher. So uh, that's where minor hockey came into my life and fueled my passion, so to speak. Um, SAIT career, SAIT was my second home for, for most of my uh, 27 years. Some people say it was my first home. I spent more time at SAIT than I did in my own house, I think. Uh, uh, SAIT was a, a, is a great institution and was a tremendous institution uh, when I worked there. Um, I worked with some great people who supported the vision we had of striving for excellence and uh, community service and academic success. And I want to thank uh, the people I worked with and the players that were, and athletes that were with me uh, during the, my time at SAIT. Um, specifically, I'd like to thank um, Phil Allen, who passed away a few years ago, a member of the Sport Hall of Fame, Ken Tisbury, and Murray McCauley. Uh, these gentlemen gave me a chance when I was a very, very young coach 
Coming out of minor hockey, midget hockey in Calgary, they gave me a chance to pursue my dream, and uh, I want to thank them for that. At SATE, uh, I met, I met a, a gentleman by the name of Timmy Lees. Timmy Lees was a volunteer, um, and Timmy uh, was a special friend to me. He uh, was a great example of loyalty and passion, and he always stood behind me and always was there to uh, chat with me after games, after tough evenings, and uh, I just want to acknowledge Timmy for everything he's meant to me in my career and, and how much he's helped me. Uh, stay with coaching. Uh, the ACAC, I'd like to acknowledge the ACAC for their great work, the great programs they ran uh, during my time in the ACAC. What a great league, what a great competitive league it was, and great coaches, great teams, great schools, and I want to thank you for that, for setting up that format. It made me a better coach and a better person. Um, through the ACAC, I was allowed to meet a gentleman by the name of Brian Stein. Brian Stein is a great supporter of uh, ACAC hockey. He's a great uh, promoter of the sport. And uh, I just want to thank him for his professionalism and all he's done to make the sport visible and uh, vibrant in, uh, as a volunteer also. Um, hockey Canada. Hockey Canada was a great, uh, provided me great opportunities. Uh, I can't thank them enough for all the opportunities. Really like to uh, acknowledge the staff I work with currently and the players I work with, uh, you folks are all tremendous and thank you for sharing the vision. And all the other uh, athletes and, and coaches and staff, members I worked with in the past, I want to thank them. Specifically though, I want to thank uh, Tom Rennie for giving me a couple of opportunities. Um, and then Scott Smith and Scott Salmon for uh, providing me with this current opportunity to coach Canada's national parent team. What a great experience it's been, and uh, we're not done yet, uh, and we're still looking forward to the Paralympic gold medal of this uh, 2022 uh, Paralympics. Um, and my family. Um, I would never have done any of this without uh, support of my children, TJ, Joe, and Jacqueline, who spent many uh, weekends and birthdays uh, with their dad not there. Uh, I want to thank them for their support and always encouraging me to uh, do the do what I love to do, and that was to coach and, and uh, be involved in coaching hockey. My wife, Debbie, she's the anchor in our family. She anchors us down. She uh, always supported, uh, supported me, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Debbie, for, for always having my back, and thank you so much. Um, Uh, while I'm very proud of all the on-ice accomplishments of our teams, uh, I'm most proud of the success of our athletes away from the rink. Most of them become very positive community contributors, and you like to feel that I had a small part in that. And, you know, it's an honor to be called coach, and I've always been proud of that honor. And uh, just want to say thank you again to Alberta Sport Hall of Fame. I'm very honored, and uh, thank you. You have to look no further than Kelly Sutherland's nickname to understand the impact he had on his chosen sport of chuck wagon racing. Known as the King, Kelly was racing at the age of 14, driving by the age of 16, and winning before he turned 23. With a career that spanned five decades, Kelly remains one of the most important influences in the sport's history. He won an astounding 12 world championships over his career, his first in 1974, and his final won in 2011 at the age of 60. Kelly is perhaps best known for his success at the Calgary Stampede. Over the course of his career, he won 12 Calgary Stampede Rangeland Derby Championships and seven Calgary Stampede Aggregate titles. Kelly retired from racing in 2017. In his 48 seasons behind the reins, he placed in the top 10 overall 41 times. Kelly took the sport to a new level of professionalism and his accomplishments on and off the track helped raise the bar for his fellow drivers. As Rangeland Derby track announcer Les McIntyre says, hockey had Gretzky, boxing had Ali, country music has George Strait, and we have Kelly Sutherland. There was a friend of mine, close friend of mine who's gone, called Mark Wagner and he'd had a rough spring and I'd had a rough spring. 
And I had upset the wagon two or three times. I had a good outfit, but I couldn't do anything. He said, I'll tell you what, he said, he reached up in the back on top of his cabinet and he pulled out a, a handful of eagle feathers. Tie this in. He says, maybe that'll change your luck. I said, I'll try anything. And I got to Calgary and I won that stampede. And I just kept looking at that feather and I said, you're a blessing, man. That thing is staying in. Our sport is 70% revenue driven by sponsorship. I learned early, you want to be recognizable. And so I started to train a little bit different. And then I, I got the right combination of horses. And then bingo, 86, I, I won it. Lots of times I lost the stampede by two one hundredths of a second. That's not as long as my cowboy hat. After 10 days of racing, two guys can be that close. So every little advantage you can give that horse so he can make one stride further, that's all it is. Eh? The biggest problem was my appetite for alcohol had consumed me and I was an alcoholic and I was getting into trouble and, and I quit drinking in 1994 and I won the stampede five out of six years after that. Looking back, the biggest rush I ever had in my life probably was, uh, you know, Calgary Stampede standing in front of you know, 20 some thousand people and just a kid and I won the stampede. I just, well, I just couldn't believe it. That memory is, is etched. Uh, my final stampede is, is etched because uh, I had a lot of, lot of people. There was a lot of tears. There was just a, a lot of emotion. That to me, those memories are worth, you know, worth pretty much everything to, to me. You know, I wanted to impact people's lives in the sport. I wanted to set the goals high enough. I said, when I leave the sport, they're going to have some stuff to shoot for, these young guys that are coming in. So. One of the things I'm so thankful for is that, you know, the sport itself is, is, is recognized as being, you know, etched in the history and the roots of Alberta. My family and, you know, I'm close, my son, Mark. I mean, probably, certainly the last, you know, decade of my life, it was, without my son, Mark, I would not have been able to compete physically. You, you have to have uh, nothing but that sport in mind. So are you willing to forgo, you know, a lot of other things in life just to become the champion? And I was, I was fortunate I had a partner that was strong. I, my wife Debbie was like that. And then I, I, I think I just, my whole life is going to be, they are going to remember me in the sport of chuck wagon racing because I just loved it so much. Wow, what amazing achievements we have seen so far this evening. Since 1957, the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame and Museum has been dedicated to the preservation and history of sport within Alberta. Tonight's ceremony has been brought to you a little differently than in the past, but to continue to honor these sports heroes, we ask that you contribute a donation of $25 to assist the Hall of Fame in its mission to developing educational programs, exhibits, and sharing the stories of these honored members. It is a real treasure here in Alberta. Please visit CanadaHelps.com or you can call us at 403-341-8614 to make your donation. Sherwood Park's Terry Morris has been active in the promotion and development of the sport of curling in Alberta and across the nation for the better part of four decades. During that time, most of Terry's exploits have flown under the radar, including his efforts to unite the sport's governance structure, which led to the establishment of the Northern Alberta Championship Curling Society, as well as the Alberta Curling Federation, we know it as Curling Alberta, which represents the province with Curling Canada. Terry's curling roots began in Edmonton after he married, becoming a competitive curler, builder, and leader.
While you typically won't see Terry's name in the headlines, his dedication and hard work behind the scenes have ensured countless curling events were run efficiently and professionally while leaving behind a positive legacy in their host communities. Curling has been my primary sport since uh, the early 70s. I uh, first got involved as a, as a player, but soon realized I wasn't uh, going to go to a Briar or a Canadian Championship. So I got in involved in uh, curling club management, and then uh, eventually I got involved into the whole provincial politics of curling. So. And then from there I went into managing events, because that was a way for us to uh, bring some money into curling into the province. In 1987 Briar, the organizers there asked me to come on and be part of the executive, the board of directors, and look after the whole facility side of it. Before I knew it, I was the vice president of that organization. The next big event we did was in 1999, which was a, again a very successful Briar. And from the profits we made in that event, we actually developed the predecessor to Curling Alberta, which was called the Alberta Curling Federation. And then from there, we went into the 2005 Briar. That had uh, just historic results. I mean, it was the biggest revenue generating Briar in Canada, the biggest event by, from an attendance perspective in the world. And uh, we just, we made a ton of money at it and we decided to invest it, put it into a portfolio where it would, it would continue to grow and let current clubs apply to this fund and each year we'd pay out forty to sixty thousand dollars to help curling clubs and market their their curling club so that they could grow the sport at the grassroots level. And that fund is uh, still exists today as the Northern Alberta Championship Curling Society. All you have to do is be able to manage a business properly and put together a good marketing plan to sell tickets. When we went to '99. We had a slogan called "The Last Shootout of the Century." that uh, just took off like crazy. In 2005, we called it the Alberta Advantage, and we sold to sold tickets only in Alberta uh, before we went on sale to the public. After 05, the Canadian Curling Association approached me and said, uh, why don't you help us manage curling events? So until this day, I do one major event for them every year. It's just the challenge, it's the, it's, great meeting with people, it's, uh, it's great organizing, it's great uh, working in the community because you've got to have to contract to a lot of people. It's, it's just very satisfying. I feel honored, but, uh, and I'm not world famous. And uh, there's a lot of people that uh, work alongside of me. I'm just the figurehead who gets the induction. And a number of them probably should have been here also. Phillips was a rugged stay-at-home defenseman who patrolled the blue line for the NHL's Ottawa Senators from 1997 all the way to 2015. Drafted first overall by the Senators at the 1996 NHL entry draft, Chris scored 71 goals to go along with 217 assists over the course of his career. On February 5th, 2015, he played in his 1,179th career regular season game with the Sens, surpassing the team record previously set by former team captain Daniel Alfredson. The Western Hockey League's Rookie of the Year in 1995-96, Chris was also a member of two gold medal winning Canadian World Junior Hockey teams in 1996 and 1997. Chris began his junior career hockey career at the age of 15 with the Fort McMurray Oil Barons of the Alberta Junior Hockey League before joining the WHL's Prince Albert Raiders in time for the 1995-96 season. In those 61 games he played with the Raiders, Chris scored 10 goals and added 30 assists on his way to winning the league's top rookie. On February 18th of 2020, Chris's jersey, number four, was retired by the Senators in a pregame ceremony. Congratulations, Chris. The family is all very proud of you. 
making uh, Junior A Oil Barons uh, at the age of 15. And, and then that same year, I made uh, Team Alberta to play in the, the Canada Games. You know, all that exposure just kept leading to more recognition and ultimately led to getting drafted. A year at Prince Albert, that was uh, an amazing experience. My first uh, World Juniors, uh, I was in Boston that year. Uh, ended up winning a gold medal. I was one of uh, two guys that, that were not drafted yet. And to be drafted number one overall in, in St. Louis that summer, that accomplishment is, is one that I'm extremely proud of. The following year, I uh, ended up getting traded halfway through the year to Lethbridge. Uh, went to the Memorial Cup. Lots of media that, that claim that you know, didn't have the defense this year to, to capture uh, the fifth in a row and that the streak was going to end. To go out and, and win a goal and, and prove everybody wrong that, that we were capable felt, you know, really good. First year, really getting the opportunity to play against uh, guys like Mario Lemieux, Wayne Kinski, um, Sergei Fedorov, Pavel Brearian. We made the, the playoffs my first season. Uh, it was the second year that the team had, had made the playoffs. Uh, that was the first playoff win for, for the organization. And yeah, that just led to, uh, I think it was 13 or 14 years in a row that we made the playoffs, uh, won a, a President's Trophy, and going to the Stanley Cup Finals in 07. Um, you know, it was just, just a, it really was an incredible run. I played as, uh, as hard as I could for the team. Wanted the team to have success. I wanted to win. I wanted to lead by example. Uh, to, you know, when you strap on the skates to, to, uh, to leave it all out there. Uh, to, you know, to not have any regrets. Edmonton's Michael Robertson was always a competitive and gifted athlete. He played hockey and soccer from the age of five before transitioning to competitive snowboarding at the age of 13. A member of a small team from Rabbit Hill Snow Resort just south of Edmonton, Mike became provincial champion in his age group at the age of 14. Two years later, he transitioned to the spo sport of snowboard cross, where his competitive nature and dedication to his chosen craft allowed him to quickly excel at the sport. Michael joined the national development team at 17 before progressing to the national team where he would remain until his career was cut short by injuries at the age of 27. Over the course of his career, he won the silver medal in men's snowboard cross at the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver, two World Cup bronze medals in 2009, and a third place finish in the Baker Banked Slalom in Washington State. From 2009 to 2012, he was the top ranked men's snowboard cross athlete in the country. I did a lot of online school and stuff, so I had the flexibility to go snowboard in the morning and come home and do a bit of school in the afternoon kind of thing and was drawn towards border cross as a competition because it suited how I liked to snowboard, I think, because I just like kind of free riding and snowboarding around the whole mountain and hitting jumps and doing turns and all that kind of stuff that encompasses all of snowboarding for me. There was a really good local series of border cross events that were kind of in and around Alberta and BC and eventually making the national development team and then eventually the national team. My first World Cup was in Canada. It was definitely an eye-opener and getting, being so young and competing against all the best guys in the world. The season before the 2010 Olympics was my best year on the World Cup. I think I finished fifth overall in the world that year. So it's definitely on a good trajectory to do well at the Olympics. I didn't want to just go and compete at these events. I wanted to go and win these events. I think the most memorable run for the Olympics was my very first qualifying run. I remember the first, the very first time I dropped in on my first qualifying run, like the crowd was just overwhelming. Like you don't usually hear that when you're snowboarding, but there you could hear it and they're cheering for you. It felt like that was the time, you know? If you're gonna go to the Olympics, you should probably do it in your home country when there's 10,000 people standing at the bottom all cheering for you. I think my biggest memory of that one is that I uh, didn't win. I think I won every single heat that I was in that day, and I was in, in the lead the entire way in the finals. 
and got passed right at the very end. Shortly after that, one of my teammates came up to me and was like, you just won an Olympic medal. It was an amazing experience, especially the medal ceremony. Like, just, you're in a huge crowd, like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. And yeah. Before the Olympics, I had a few pretty serious concussions, and then uh, it was the next event after the Olympics, I had a huge crash and had a big concussion. And I was like pretty much sitting in my basement for like six months after that, like in the dark, kind of. It was a really tough blow, because I had all these goals that I wanted to achieve, like winning the Olympics and, and numerous things, you know? And, and to get that cut short is definitely, it's tough, but it's just uh, now looking back, it's just a part of life and you just move on. And, and take it for what it is and appreciate the things that I had. Just kind of a normal dude who enjoyed snowboarding and turned into, yeah, turned into an Olympian. Derek Douglas may have been born to be a soccer referee. In a career spanning almost two decades, he has officiated at every level possible. He started officiating in 1973, shortly after settling in Sherwood Park, Alberta with his young family. In 1981, Derek was a certified as a national soccer referee and began officiating in the North American Soccer League the following season, a position he held until the league folded in 1984. Two years later, he became one of the first Alberta-based soccer officials to be promoted to the position on Federal International Football Association, FIFA Soccer Referees. When he wasn't officiating, Derek could be found promoting the sport on a local, provincial, and national level. In an officiating career that lasted from 1981 to 2000 at the national and international level, Derek officiated games across North and Central America. In the mid-1990s, Derek shifted his focus to the development of female soccer officials locally, provincially, nationally, and internationally. At the age of 77 and after seven plus decades in the sport, Derek continues to grow the sport locally as a part-time ref coordinator in Sherwood Park. One of my colleagues at CN said, my son's playing tonight, would you come and watch? I said, sure. And as it happened many times, no referee. Rather than let the kids have nobody, I, I started to referee. And from then on, it's just been sort of going up different higher levels. In any of the leagues that were professional in Edmonton, indoor and out, I got a chance to, to officiate. And in 1987, I was uh, appointed to the Federation International list, which is FIFA. I think it was when I got my FIFA badge and I put it on my shirt, went onto the field, figuring everybody's going to see that FIFA badge and they're going to be. None of them saw the badge, right? It was just, it was a highlight to me that I had the badge. Good career and in 1992, the year of my 50th birthday, I had to come off the list at the end of the year. Blowing a whistle is the hardest thing for any referee to do. And yet, it's the easiest thing, but for the kids, when you blow that whistle, what happens? Everybody stops and they look at you. If you know the laws of the game and you control a game based on the laws of the game, you can't go wrong. And that's why even now, and I've been doing this since 1973, I read the law book cover to cover every year. Every year. I think the, the, the one that some of the players said that I was a player's referee has got to be the best compliment that I could ever make. Because then, then you understand that the players respect you because they know you know the laws of the game. It actually, it grew into a passion for me. It really did because I enjoy it. I enjoy it to this day. I'd love, I go out. If one of them can't make it at the last minute, I'll go out and do the game myself. I have my gear in the car all the time. I love being a referee. Best thing I ever did.
pivotal figure as president of the 1983 Western Canada Summer Games in Calgary, helping in the development and funding of the game's flagship facility, the Repsol Sports Centre, John Curry's vision and dedication to Alberta amateur sport is unquestioned. At the time it was constructed, the RSC was the largest multi-sport complex of its kind in our country. During the games, over 2,500 athletes from the four Western provinces and the Northwest Territories competed in 23 Summer Olympic sports, supported by a team of 5,000 volunteers. Since then, the center has become the training ground for countless amateur athletes, as well as numerous Olympic and Paralympic athletes. At the time, Calgary was considering a bid for the 1983 Western Canada Summer Games in the mid-1970s, there weren't any indoor training facilities available within the city's boundaries. Winning the games in 1979 pro proved to be the impetus needed to make the Lindsay Park Sports Centre, later became the Talisman Centre, now the Repsol Sports Centre, a reality. The game-changing facility is the home training centre for seven amateur dryland and four amateur aquatic sports, featuring a roster of 36 teams and over 8,000 amateur athletes. It also hosts approximately 53 international, national, provincial and local sports competitions each year, welcoming over 1.5 million visitors. My oldest daughter was in track Winter would come and there was no facility. So they were running in school gymnasium. The coach of, of that club had heard, knew about the Western Canada Summer Games. It suggested to us that if we could band together and bring the, bring the Western Canada Summer Games to Calgary, we could probably get the government to support Calgary in building some facilities. We were more interested in the track side but the, all the parents also wanted a swimming facility. And uh, so we put the two of them together under a tent, which was tricky to find a, an architect who could design that. But there was a, a facility in Germany, and, and this is it. In addition to this, we built a land sport, new, new baseball, new softball diamonds, new uh, swimming facilities for summer, summer events. So it was, a, it was a big event. It took us 5,000 volunteers, five years. Ordinary citizens that just want exercise, we wanted a facility for them. Then we wanted a facility for the school system. Then we wanted a facility for the higher trained athletes. And we were able to combine the entire thing in this facility. There's swimming, there's gymnastics, there's basketball, there's all the track sports, uh, and it's wonderful. It's all what Calgary and Canada stands for. It happens here. It's now the uh, busiest facility in Canada and has been for many years. And I'm told the second largest, second busiest per square foot in North America. My experience always has been in the many organizations I've been involved with is if there are good people, the job gets done. And especially here in Alberta, we always finish the job. Anybody that's in, in this business knows it takes a group. <laughs> and the leader may be the spokesman and has certain responsibilities, and, and, but it has to share the success. Well, I, I certainly want to uh, thank uh, Jeff Book, who's the general manager of the Repsol Center, who initiated the application for, uh, uh, on uh, his knowledge of how, what the importance of Repsol Center is to Calgary and Alberta, and its history. So Jeff was really the, the one that pushed this and my, uh, my own family got involved with Jeff. And uh, I didn't know this was going on at all. I think they worked for some months putting together all of the sponsors that have added their, their names and their organizations to, to uh, support uh, this very prestigious award. 
So thank you, Jeff, and thank you, my kids. Well, right, right at the very beginning of the, the concept uh, for this place, it, it, it was parents that were involved. And so my wife was a major uh, thrust behind me when she, when she heard about what we were up to. And she gave full support to the time that was required um, away from her and from the children. So we put in a lot of hours to do this. But she's been like that with me with so many projects, always that uh, she backed me behind it. And so I just want to say uh, she, she was a part of this, this facility too. She's walked this track many hours herself. Just to, and, and now we've been using it. Both of us have had some heart issues. And the, this is the Cardiac Facility Institute is here tied in with this. So we, we end up six weeks after, if you have a, an episode with heart, you end up walking this track under the uh, supervision of uh, medical people. And it's happened to my wife, and it's happened to me, and so we're both glad from that point of view that it's here. Um, so I just want to say thank you to my wife for all the, all the support she's given to me and to Calgary. If you are a promising soccer player in Alberta, you can probably trace some of your success back to Stan Wakelin. Born in England, Stan moved to Calgary in 1905 and lived there until his death in 1976. Throughout the 1910s and 20s, Stan, three of his brothers, and his father were members of the storied Calgary Hillhurst FC Soccer Club, which won the Canadian National Championship in 1922, as well as three straight, straight provincial championships from 1922 to 24. Nicknamed Porridge, Stan was selected as one of the top 100 footballers as part of Canada's Soccer Centennial and was a finalist for the Canadian press's best in 50 footballers from 1900 to 1950. He was inducted into the Canadian Soccer Hall of Fame in 2017. Stanley York Wakelin was born in Sutherland, England in May of 1890. In 1915, 24-year-old Stan enlisted with the Canadian forces and served with the 31st Battalion during World War I. In 1922, Calgary Hillhurst FC won the Dominion of Canada Football Championship over Toronto with Stan, a centre forward, serving as the team captain. It was the only time in the championship's first 60 years that it was won by a team hailing from our province. Stan also played on a Calgary All-Star team that faced off against a number of international teams from England and Scotland that were touring Canada. Away from the pitch, Stan worked for Canada Post for 38 years and was also a member of the Royal Canadian Legion. In 1962, the Calgary Herald's Dunk Scott said Stan was, quote, probably the greatest centre forward this city has ever seen. It's uh, very important that we do recognize pioneers such as Stan, who back in the early 1900s was a, a very instrumental player here in Alberta and Calgary in particular. Yeah, I mean, he played for a club called Calgary Hillhurst, who won a, a bunch of Canadian championships. Uh, they were the top team in, in Alberta at that time, represented Alberta well and, and nationally. And then Stan also played in all-star teams that got put together and played against truly European sides that were professionals and, and acquitted themselves quite well. And uh, he was well respected amongst his peers in, in the sport at that time. From a soccer perspective, I think um, being named in the top 100 soccer players in Canada was, was tremendous. And then being picked in the Canadian Soccer Hall of Fame for his accomplishments was big as well. It's a, it's a pioneer award. He was a soccer pioneer. He, he represented Calgary and Alberta on the national stage very well. Uh, he played in the hardest position, the centre forward to score goals, and he did that in abundance. Um, I think players like Alfonso Davis, you know, Stan Wakeman created the platform for those types of players to move on to bigger and better things. And to have someone from Alberta uh, 
receive this award in, uh, in the soccer is absolutely fantastic. As the team who pioneered equestrian sport broadcasting in the province, Nancy Southern and Ian Allison are the first duo to be awarded the Bell Memorial Award. From initial funding of approximately $80,000 to set up Alberta's first digital TV studio in 1990, Nancy and Ian have grown the studio into a powerhouse, one that reaches a global audience in excess of 1 billion people through national part partners including Rogers, CBC and CTV, as well as through partnerships with a variety of international broadcasters. Since opening in Southwest Calgary in 1975, Spruce Meadows has raised the profile of show jumping on a provincial, national and global level. Nancy and Ian helped develop that first digital TV studio in 1990, which was quite progressive at the time. Before opening the studio, Nancy and Ian spent as much time as they could learning from the experts. During the 1988 Ken Calgary Winter Olympics, the duo had the opportunity to shadow a number of ABC television producers. The next year, Nancy attended the Electronic Festival in Cannes as a guest of ABC. She used her time to learn about the necessities to build a top flight studio. In the studio's early years, it attracted the attention of CTV's Wide World of Sports, which televised Spruce Meadows Grand Prix. This led to the Spruce Meadows Today series, which aired on the network for 25 years. Ian, the voice of Spruce Meadows, lends his talents to the CBC broadcast team covering the Spruce Meadows events and was the co-commentator for the show jumping events at the 2016 Summer Games in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He was also the co-announcer at the 2017 World Equestrian Games in Normandy, France. Today, Spruce Meadows Television Production Unit produces over 130 hours of programming for distribution in over 110 countries worldwide. As of 2018, the company's broadcast reach exceeds, as I mentioned, 1 billion people. Well, we're very proud of what Spruce Meadows is and how we started and we knew that we wanted to raise the bar in terms of the standard of excellence that we could bring to the sport. Mr. Southern and Mrs. Southern knew from the very beginning if it was going to be more than a regional event, television was going to be an important part of the story uh, to attract athletes, to attract sponsorship, uh, or a credibility card if nothing else. About 1985-86, we were, were looking at different ways to expand more than the 10, 12, 22 minute blocks on Wide World of Sport. So uh, conceptualized something called Spruce Meadows Television. And while the, the word Spruce Meadows Television sounds like a pretty, pretty robust organization, it was two people. <laughs> Our real break came due to the 1988 Winter Olympics in Calgary. ABC Sports was looking for a venue to host all of their key sponsors. And We'd ask that they carry Spruce Meadows in return for using the facilities for their hosting venue. And that really was the beginning of our international experience for uh, televising the sport of show jumping. Because we were getting into so much production and tailoring programming for, uh, for the world market, uh, we did a business case for putting in production facilities. And digital data cam was the new thing. So we built the first digital beta camp suite in Canada. There are so many great moments. Uh, calling Ian Miller on Big Ben, winning the CP International Grand Prix at Spruce Meadows three times. That was spectacular. And then of course the next one is Eric Lamaze on Hickstead. And what a force to be reckoned with. Nancy and I both knew that for the horse sport aficionados, you could basically tape a picture of a horse to a television and they would watch. We were trying to attract the people who are watching Major League Baseball, the people who are watching the CFL or the NBA, and to convince them uh, of the, the merits of this sport and what it took to be the very best in the world. I just feel so much pride and I want to thank all of the people in the television industry that helped me and Ian be who we are and my mom and dad for uh, giving us the leeway and the runway to pursue a dream.
Oh, Quinn, thank you so much for this incredible honor uh, by recognizing Ian and myself. We are so thrilled to, to be here with everyone tonight virtually. And the sport has been so good to us. We've enjoyed talking about the sport to many fans over many years. Ian? It really has been an incredible ride, Nancy. Uh, the first broadcast from Spruce Meadows in June of 1976 on Wide World of Sport. And as your father called it, this unlikely facility in this unlikely place has been able to go around the world through television. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to tell the stories. The early days were quite something, though. Uh, as you mentioned, just a few minutes on Wide World of Sports to being able to broadcast over 80 hours of television around the world and making the sport more familiar and more popular with so many people. And I also want to thank so many in the broadcast industry from the early beginnings of our careers at CFCN through CTV and CBC, the Sky Sports, the ESPNs, all of those around the world that have believed in us and, and made our sport become as popular as it is today. Well, you raise a really good point because it's been made by Albertans, not just ourselves. When I think of Hugh Dunn and Gordeno, Betty Park, the great crews here for both CTV and, and uh, CBC Sports, they're the benchmark around the world for this. And we've been able to also enjoy the great stories of whether it be Ian Miller or Gail Greeno, Linda Southern Hethcott, Mark Laskin. Uh, there's been some amazing Canadian stories and, of course, the global players in this sport. And our fans, our fans in Alberta, as you say, Ian, really have made this sport. The people that have embraced Bruce Meadows um, from all walks of life, through all generations, it's really been a marvelous, exciting adventure for us. And uh, thank you so much to everyone. Oh, there we go, our typical duo on TV, um, me stepping on top of you, but thank you so much to the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame and congratulations to all of the recipients, so well deserved, and it's a great honor to be amongst you. Few people can claim to have done more for building sport throughout Alberta than Dennis Kadatz. His legacy includes an impressive coaching career that began at the age of 22 when he guided the Edmonton Huskies junior football team to back-to-back -back national titles. It includes his work at the University of Calgary where he was the first coach of the UFC Dinos football team and later the university's first athletic director. And it includes his work with the Calgary Olympic Development Association, one of the most successful post-Olympic organizations in the world. Raised on the family farm southeast of Edmonton, Dennis played football with the Edmonton Huskies junior football team and then with the University of Alberta Golden Bears while pursuing his bachelor's of physical education. Dennis's legacy on the gridiron would be cemented when he was hired as head coach by the University of Calgary to help launch their fledgling football program. Dennis was appointed as UFC's first athletic director in 1966 and would remain in that position until 1985. He would also add the title of associate dean in the Faculty of Physical Education, where he put his PhD in athletic facility administration to good use, overseeing the design of the Jack Simpson Gym and the Olympic Oval. In 1985, Dennis was recruited to oversee another organization in its infancy, the Calgary Olympic Development Association. First as general manager, followed by president, Dennis was chief steward of the funds and facilities that helped ensure Olympic venues, such as Canada Olympic Park, were accessible to athletes and the community. After retiring in 1999, Dennis would look out at Canada Olympic Park from his Calgary home, feeling satisfied he had contributed to the original promise made by Calgary's Olympic bid. Part of the legacy in Calgary will be specialized sports facilities that will continue to challenge athletes as they test their abilities and hone their skills. Dennis was previously inducted into the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame in 2005 as a member of the 1962-64 Edmonton Huskies and in 2010 with the 1983-85 University of Calgary Dinos. 1961, Dennis and I were married. We moved into our first little apartment and Dennis got a phone call 
from the Husky organization saying that they would like him to talk to him about becoming the next head coach. Dennis was 22, only a couple of years older than the players that he was going to coach when that first uh, football team all came to breakfast our, at our little apartment, left their shoes outside the door, walked onto our new white shag rug, and how we fit, you know, 35 people into a little apartment. But that was the start of what sport meant to Dennis. You involved people, you became friends, you created relationships. It was uh, Dennis's direction and his, his ability to pull us all together that uh, built that team and built its dynasty. My comment always was he took a, a bunch of young guys and he developed us and molded us into the men. And that was also uh, one of his attributes. That he was just uh, a person who was able to motivate people. And uh, I, I think without question, that's why those Husky teams were so successful. I would call him a visionary uh, in that uh, when they selected him, uh, he was going to be the coach, of course, uh, but he wasn't just going to be the coach. He was going to get things going right off the bat. and. He got the university going as far as the athletic program in a very short period of time. Uh, he had a vision for, for every team and for the athletic department as a, as a whole. Dennis's vision and commitment and hardworking endeavors that helped create the Jimmy Condon University scholarships for the province of Alberta and our university athletes. When he moved on to uh, Coda, he brought those skills that people acquire playing team sports. At one time, they were one of only two, I believe, organizing committees that had all the facilities still open after the games. So it's clearly been the, the mainstay and the success of the uh, Alberta, Canada athletic community, winter athletic community. He was very interested in what everybody was doing. Uh, so much that he used to tour around the park, tour around Canalivic Park, check on everybody, but the employees got smart after a while and they had out a DK alert so that when he was out touring, they were telling everybody to make sure they were doing the damn job. I don't recall him ever taking anybody to task. They knew what they had to do, and he knew what they had to do, and he just went around, and he'd get out of the, out of the truck and go and visit with them. He was, a, he was a friend of theirs, too, as well as the boss. Clearly the best boss I've ever had. Very serious when he had to be, he was smart. Uh, he, could, uh, he had a vision, he could get people to work for him and with him. There are three qualities about Dennis that I really respect and that is trust, respect, and responsibility. And he exhibited those throughout his entire uh, professional uh, life. He was highly competitive uh, as well, um, but always keeping in mind the educational values he had for each and every one of his athletes that he coached. He was uh, a visionary, he was a builder, and he was a pioneer. He was fun to be with, but he was also a very hard worker. Uh, he set goals, he met goals. He was able to bring the best out in people. He had a we-can-do-this kind of an attitude. Isn't it a shame that we can't be at the usual dinner that the Sports Hall of Fame has to honor all of these special people? That Dennis is receiving this is quite an honor for all of us. My family, our children and grandchildren are all so proud of what he's accomplished in his life. I have written a little, um, I guess you could call it a speech, but I have made a few remarks here, and in case I forget something, I think that I would like to read through it. Our family wants to 
graciously accept this award for him as Dennis passed away just over two years ago. So on behalf of Karen and Paul, Kim, Brian, and Kurt, and Sine, we thank you. Natalie, Lauren, Gianni, Elsa, Ingrid, and Conrad are so proud of their OPA. Thanks also need to be given to all the athletes, coaches, and colleagues that Dennis interacted with throughout his career. Education, sport, and hard work were important to Dennis. His parents, Ted and Elsie, moved to Edmonton from the farm so that he could compete, complete his education. And with that PE degree and the reputation of being a hardworking team member, he became the head coach of the Edmonton Huskies football team in 1961. And he only had a few, he was only a few years older than the boys that he was going to be coaching. The su success of that team led him to start the U of C Dino football program, to teach at the U of C, become the athletic director, and then move on to the Calgary Olympic Development Association, CODA, now Winsport, and to start the National Sports School. Dennis created relationships and friendships throughout the sports, his sports career. I have to put my glasses on, I can't see. <laughs> there were just so many people. Everyone had a part to play, expectations to be met, respect earned, goals set, goals met, do your best, work hard, in athletics and in life, and so the legacy goes. The living legacy is exemplified in the recent appointment of Jessica Zelenka as the UFC's new track and field coach. Jessica was the winner of the 2007 Dr. Dennis Kadat's Outstanding Female Athlete of the Year Award and became an Olympic athlete. That's the legacy of sport, and so it goes on. Dennis would have been so happy to be a part of this recognition. Once again, I would like to thank you, the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame, for this recognition on Dennis's behalf. Thank you. As we wrap up the evening, we would like to pass along another thank you to our sponsors for their generous support in helping us to host this memorable evening. When you choose National Motor Coach Systems for your transportation, you will enjoy the comfort and convenience that comes from riding in our fleet of charter vehicles. National Motor Coach, making moments memorable. Thank you to Dayville, RBC, National Motor Coach, Alberta Government, Hockey Canada, Hockey Alberta, City of Red Deer, Curling Canada, Curling Alberta, Lethbridge Hurricanes, Ottawa Senators, Equestrian Canada, Football Alberta, Big 105, 1067, Rewind Radio, RD News Now. I hope everyone enjoyed celebrating this special evening to honor our 2020 inductees. Keep up to date with the Alberta Sports Hall of Fame as we get set to announce the 2021 class of inductees over the coming week. Click the links in the description to stay connected. Have a great night.